As a coach, when we're trying to help athletes manage their own pain, we think first and foremost, is this an injury? Is, there, is this rabies of the knee? Is there a bone sticking out? Do I have a clear mechanism of injury? Well, if that's the case, get out of here. If my athlete can't uh, move, can't participate, can't do their job, can't occupy their role in society, that's our clear mark of injury, and we ask them to get checked out. Everything else, though, this is in the domain of training, especially as we begin to appreciate more and more society that pain does not necessarily mean tissue damage. We like to say pain can be a lot of different things, right? But more importantly, what do I do about it? So what ends up happening then is we say, oh, pain is a medical problem. Go deal with a medical practitioner. I look around, I'm like, there aren't any doctors in here. There aren't any physical therapists in here. So where do we go? Now, the internet, modern training has given us a whole host of tools to be able to manage, desensitize. I mean, we are inundated with techniques and tools, especially as rehab has further and further crept into the language of performance, right? Even the language, word of prehab is somehow like I'm always injured a little bit or I'm going to try to prevent some kind of injury mechanism. So those are difficult things to, to make claims about. But what is useful is creating sort of a taxonomy and uh, uh, an organizing system to see how these things relate and how behaviors that I can engage in in the gym may help me to return to a, a pain-free state and more importantly, improve my function. And what you'll see is that sometimes the same tools that we're using to improve function or enhance athletic recovery can be the same sets of tools that I'm using to make myself feel better if I overdo it or I'm hypohydrated or I'm injured or, or excuse me, I have a previous injury and this uh, sometimes this gets sore, adaptation error, whatever the language is. So we have a simple model called the D2R2 model and that's D2 R2. And of course, I would love to call it R2D2, but someone else took that. But the idea here is, first of all, first order of business is desensitize. Sensitize. And what we want to make sure is that we appreciate that many, 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 many people have pain as a common experience in their daily lives. If you go into a high school or even middle school and ask those kids how many of you are pain free, you'll be shocked to see how many kids do not raise their hands because they are not pain free. So we start with the assumption that pain is actually the pain free is actually the resting state of the human being. But it's very common to have pain, stiffness, soreness, right? That can be a huge subjective experience. If I poured it into the brains of some of the women mountain bikers I work with during their World Cup competition, I would die. I would just couldn't handle that kind of pain. So we, we understand. And we want us to appreciate that pain is very much information and we're treating it more and more like just information about lack, like lack of force production, lack of power output, right? Lack of range of motion, just another sensitization, another, another piece of information from the tissues that my brain is interpreting. So, but order of business is, hey, that's really well and good, but my knee hurts and I don't want it to hurt because it, we know that that pain disrupts force production, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, it can just be plain old fashioned annoying. So we have a whole bunch of tools then that can fall into this desensitized model. That may be blood flow restriction can help me desensitize. That could be percussion. That might be voodoo floss. That might be massage. That might be contract relax, right? I might be able to desensitize that quickly in the gym, help my athlete be able to manage that themselves so they can feel better. We know that people are managing and desensitizing pain all the time. Ibuprofen, alcohol, THC, right? They're People are already doing plenty of self-medication in this desensitization model, and it's actually disingenu disingenuous for coaches and even providers to say that pain is always a medical problem. What we want to do is, again, have that clear line of saying, when is pain a serious problem? When I can't occupy my role in society, when I think it's pathological, or I have a clear mechanism of injury. Poop, get out of here. But the rest of the time, this falls on the person to be able to make themselves feel better. It's called self-soothing. It's what we're doing, right? So. Well, this could be, you know, you can put self-soothing any way you want. But desensitize the first one. The second one, what we find, is if we can decongest. And the Chinese language might be stagnation. Um, we see swelling, congestion. And it may be as simple as just reconciling the fact that our lymphatic system isn't being pumped, right? The lymphatic system, as our friends uh, Perry Nicholson says, it's, it's the sewage system of the body. It's so natural process, not just swelling goes out of that, but the natural processes of metabolism and all the other things that happen in the body, all of those proteins and things get waste, brought out through the waste 
of the lymphatic system, not necessarily the circulatory system. So what we see is that oftentimes we can improve people's sensation, how their brain is perceiving tissues by doing things like walking, right? That's a simple decongestion model. Muscle contraction drives lymphatic drainage. But also, we may be able to downregulate someone's threat level in their brain by taking some of the swelling out of a congested tissue. Or we'll be able to create a healthy environment where that normal healing process is going to do its thing anyway, but maybe blunted or attenuated because I have a congested, overly congested tissue. So notice the first order of business. I mean, these are sort of big ideas, right? How do I go and locally make this feel better? How can I can decongest this? If you've ever worked with an NMES device, a decongestion device, a neuromuscular electric stem device, that's one of the mechanisms by which they work really, really powerfully. Improving blood flow, even you might even put in things like taking beet juice, right, for the nitrous oxide release to improve uh, circulation and, and, and those things to decongest. Get the garbage out, bring the groceries in. But then that falls the, next to the R2. And what we like to say is, well, reperfuse. Reperfuse. And that's one word, but I'm just going to put that there so you can see what we're talking about. And the reperfusion is just saying that, hey, sometimes improving blood flow in an area can be very palliative. It makes people feel a lot better. So suddenly blood flow restriction, exercise is important. If I have a tendon problem but don't load the tendon and get that tendon and gorgeous blood, I'm going to have a problem. I'm going to see just incomplete healing, complete movement. Remember, the base of being a human being is mechanotransduction. I have to load tissues in order for those tissues to move and do what they need to do and to be effective. And blood flow to old ischemic, tack down old and cold problems is actually a problem. So, you know, what does this look like? Well, it looks like exercise and movement. Right, and maybe this, that does not just mean heavy fives, right, or heavy threes. It may just mean I need to get a good old-fashioned bodybuilding pump, or whew, we're back into that NMES, right? That could be blood flow restriction in here. But what we find is that sometimes if we can just get these things pumped up with blood before we move, we can feel better again and make that system more robust. We even see that with uh, people do a lot of parachuting in the military. We see it with our major league pitchers. Just getting them a good pump in the elbows can do a lot to just make those tissues more robust. And the brain ultimately realizing that they don't need to, doesn't need to keep an eye on that or recognize that as a threat. Or when I get sleep deprived, stressed, um, hypohydrated, poor nutrition, whatever it is, my body doesn't, my brain's gonna interpret that uh, signal as easily as a pain signal. And the last one is restore. So what we can think of is what is the body supposed to be able to do and why can't we do that? So restore might be improving or changing someone's movement, limiting their compensation, right? That stable compensation. Look, you can walk like that, but you're going to be slow. So even changing someone towards a better expression, the highest expression of a movement pattern, which is how most of the best coaches in the world teach, even they teach beginners and kids what the highest expression of the movement is, just in case they ever want to go there someday, right? We don't say it's good enough. You can drive the car well enough. This is, this is how we drive. This is, this is the best expression of how your body can move, putting that skill back into this. So restoring that movement, but also you could say, well, let's restore um, range of motion. So maybe just giving the body better access to its negative range of motion positions can do a lot to make someone feel better or at least unload a tissue mechanic so the brain doesn't see it as threat anymore. You could also say, man, this restore, let's restore to your basic physiology of human being. Should you be able to sleep? Are you drinking water? Let's restore that. Are you eating whole foods? Do you feel loved? So this restore could be mechanical, but it certainly could be environmental, right? And what we know is this is suddenly a simple way, a mnemonic, this R2-D2, D2-R2, for us to be able to categorize and say what are we going to prioritize so that we can help this people's, person self-soothe, so they can feel better, so they can get back to the business of being human, which is moving. Hope that helps.